Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the Local Leadership for Sustainable Urban Development panel. Yeah, I hope everybody had a very nice lunch and is excited for another uh, busy afternoon. We come together today as a community, and I think we can all agree that virtual isn't best. We're probably tired of Zooms, but quite frankly, this is a conversation that we couldn't delay any further because we as a development community, we are, we are on the clock. We have one decade to deliver on the SDGs. Uh, and quite frankly, you know, it's, we're probably already behind schedule in, in achieving that, that delivery of those goals. Uh, my name is Stephen Murray, and I'm a board member of the Society of International Development, Washington, DC. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Um, my background is in private equity in frontier markets. And so for me, from a private equity context, I'm quite comfortable with the 10 year horizon because that kind of matches the horizon of most private equity funds. And I really think as a development community, if we're going to deliver on the SDGs, we have to think more like the private sector. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how private equity has organized itself into 10 year cycles. And maybe that can help, you know, uh, inspire some of you to organize yourselves in a similar way. Um, so if you look at most traditional private equity funds, we spend the first few years uh, prioritizing investments that are gonna meet our, our investment objectives. That's what we need to do as a community. We need to prioritize high impact and achievable and cost-effective interventions in these early years. And then like a private equity fund, we need to provide resources, leadership and expertise to scale these interventions in the middle years of the fund. And then we need to prepare to exit. In this case, hand off these interventions to local leaders so they can continue to deliver upon these goals. So today we're gonna to hear from three such local dynamic leaders. And we're very excited to have them on this panel. And we're also very excited to have John MacArthur moderate this panel. Let me quickly, before I turn it over to John, give you an ever so brief uh, kind of snapshot of his bio. John is a senior fellow at Brookings. Uh, he will soon lead the Center for Sustainable Development there, which we're very excited about. John is an author, a teacher, and a visionary leader within the development space. Earlier in his career, John also worked very closely with UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Sid Washington had the pleasure to honor Secretary General Annan two years ago at our annual dinner. And it's nice to have you here, John, and, and, and we thank you for the work you've done uh, with the United Nations and you continue to do at Brookings. And with that, John, the floor is yours. Have a great panel, everybody. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. Such a pleasure to be here and your generous introduction, I should say, uh, by way of uh, out outset, you know, I was one of many, many people who had the privilege to work with the uh, Secretary General Anand. And uh, as we have a local leader from Ghana here today, uh, I think we uh, you know, we all miss him dearly, uh, especially at times of crisis like this in the world. And the second anniversary of his passing just came. So thank you for honoring him <laughs> with the mention of it. Um, but with that said, we're looking forward today and we're building in many ways on the legacy of Secretary General Anon in talking about the sustainable development goals, which are the successor to the millennium development goals that took shape under his leadership. And these sustainable development goals are going through a very interesting uh, moment right now, I would say. Uh, and I should also add, I'm here today, uh, you know, a little bit filling in for my colleague, uh, Tony Pippa, who is uh, really at Brookings and in other roles, working with many of the mayors uh, on the line and other people I'm thinking the audience on. How do we really localize this discussion? Because that's where so much of the action is. <laughs> but maybe not enough of the policy movement is in order to support the local leadership that is confronting so much of the crisis of the day. And, and one of the things that Tony has really helped me get clarity around, and I think many others work, working with, again, many of the people we're about to hear from is, you know, the city leaders in particular, local leaders are facing something of a, an extraordinary double burden right now. First, they're through the COVID crisis, the economic shutdowns, many in the US, but in many other countries, many of the social tensions around inequality, systemic racism, other challenges of who's getting left behind and why. 
whether it's the healthcare crisis of the moment or the economic and social crisis that persists, it's the local leaders who are the front line. It's the local leaders who are facing the brass tax questions of are people getting the services they need? It's the local leaders whose uh, tax revenues are often uh, most quickly cut off uh, in the moment of crisis. It's the local leaders who are often the ones that the uh, national leaders think about last rather than first, or too often think about last rather than first, even though they have these extraordinary responsibilities in leading and serving their communities. At the same time, uh, the local leaders are also the ones who are going to be leading the rebuilding, the transition process back to what many of us are calling not even a, a, a great reset, but a, a great transition towards a new normal. So whether it's the new infrastructure that's going to be needed for sustainability, whether it's the new urban planning that's going to help uh, manage space and the health of our communities, whether it's uh, the basic services or even the, in, in, depending on the jurisdiction, the security policing services that will keep everyone safe. It's the local leaders who are often being asked to confront these big, big challenges, but might be uh, in a certain way feeling like they have their arm tied behind their back because of the crisis and the economic constraints that are being put upon them to tackle them over the long term. And so in, in many places, it's not just impossible to return to business as usual, and no one would want to return to the pre-crisis normal in many ways, as much as we're all desiring normalcy. But many of them are really helping us understand, I would argue, much more crisply. And it's, in my experience as an economist, un, an undetended to challenge uh, how we work at the federal and local and international levels in a more coherent way in the cooperation for the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think we have three tremendous leaders to help us understand some of the practicalities around that today. So just to introduce the three leaders we have, uh, three extraordinary mayors who you know, really think about, I think quite deeply issues of representation, uh, how to hear the voices and serve the voices at the local level, uh, managing power, uh, how to think about the true interface of you know, top-bottom politics and power and where those constraints really lie, and, and also just the basics of budgeting. You know, how do we think through resources uh, when a city might not have access to the same capital structures that a national government might have access to and has a very different often, depending on, again, depending on the jurisdiction, very different set of economic constraints in tackling these very uh, front to face issues. So just to go through alphabetically, at least by uh, family name, we have from Ghana, uh, Mayor Mohamed Ajay Soa. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we're delighted and honored to have you today. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, he's uh, not just the mayor of Accra, and uh, leading extraordinary work there. He describes himself, in, importantly, not as a politician or a public servant, but as a social entrepreneur and brings a career of uh, social entrepreneurship to his work uh, in, in leading local communities. He's a founder and executive director of the Social Enterprise Agenda and also has uh, extensive experience in the private sector. And importantly, he also represents African mayors as vice chair on the steering committee of the C40 Cities Group. Uh, which, as many of you might know, is a climate leadership group of cities around the world. He's also on the uh, board of the Global Covenant of Mayors on Climate and Energy, representing African mayors. And I, I have to add, as someone who grew up uh, spending a lot of time in swimming pools, he's the uh, chairperson of the Greater Accra Swimming Association. So very active in his community and the future generations of, uh, of sport and healthy living. Uh, second, we have uh, Mayor Yvonne Aki Sawyer, uh, Mayor of Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, mayor Aki Sawyer has uh, been in office since May of 2020, uh, after over 25 years as a finance professional in uh, private sector experience and strategic planning. She's a, a chartered accountant by profession, but she's also no stranger to crisis. Uh, having been involved uh, with as director of planning at the National Ebola Response Center during the Ebola pandemic of 2014 to 2015. So this is not her first pandemic, 
but she's also dealing with an extraordinary mix of issues in the context of Sierra Leone's overall uh, development story. And then third is Mauricio Rodas, who's the former mayor of uh, Quito, Ecuador. Uh, he has been, uh, you know, had a, a lawyer by training, has started his professional career with the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and, uh, and the Caribbean, ECLAC, <laughs> to many of us from the UN system, and uh, later worked as a policy consultant actually for the Mexican government. Uh, he's been involved in uh, countless uh, initiatives himself, executive director of the Ethos Public Policy Lab, a think tank in Mexico, and then uh, returned to Ecuador in 2011 and has been active, uh, was mayor from 2014 to 2019, so not too long since he's been in office. Uh, but he's also uh, was hosting uh, a UN conference on urban sustainable development, uh, Habitat 3, so really been a, a coordinator of global conversations for many years. He's currently based at the University of Pennsylvania as a scholar at the Penn Institute for Urban Research. So, and, and very active still in launching some new initiatives, which I hope we can get into today. So maybe without uh, further ado, I'd love to just take up this question and, and, and ask each of you, because there's so, I would, I would argue, even though SDG 11 was something of a watershed in bringing the issues of cities to the forefront of the global development, sustainable development policy conversation. We're not there yet in terms of everyone understanding just what the role is of mayors and local governments in advancing sustainable development. So I'm wondering just if we could ask each of you, uh, maybe just to start out in the same order in which I introduced you, yeah. What does it look like to you and how do you define the role of mayors and local leaders in advancing sustainable development from your perspective? So uh, maybe we can start out uh, with the, the Ghanaian perspective or at least Accra perspective, uh, Mr. Mayor. Well, that, that, thank you very much uh, for the general's introduction. Um, it appears that uh, every now and then we have to attend programs and your profile has to be read to you and you have to ask yourself, are you the same person they are describing or someone else, you know? So, <laughs> but thank you very much. Uh, and let me also say um, a very good evening from our crowd to my colleague panelists and, and to you all um, for this wonderful opportunity given to us. Um, I read a little bit about your organization and I found it very, very resourceful for, for us to participate in it because we are likely to be enriched with a lot of knowledge. And to answer your question specifically, well, as, as males, uh, our primary responsibility is to drive equitable local economic development. And in doing so, we also have to look at a broad framework that we need to pursue that um, development agenda. Um, for us in Accra and Ghana as a country, we've chosen the SDG framework. So every local authority in terms of your medium term development planning, which is a four year development plan, renewable every four year, and your budgeting must be aligned to the SDGs so that we are able to track your contributions to the SDGs. And that as a standard um, uh, framework that we are using in Ghana. I must say that um, in Ghana, we started that um, process about two years ago and because of our position in Accra, uh, we've also subjected ourselves to a couple of um, uh, uh, programs that had also enhanced our capabilities to appreciate the SDGs and looked at the key targets as we aligned our programs to. Um, Accra, it's also the first having worked with the Economic Commission of Africa to um, prepare um, a voluntary um, assessment of um, 
of our SDGs uh, submitted to um, ECA, that's the Economic Commission of Africa. Uh, it is very important to say that um, uh, a lot has been said about the SDGs, but we've not been able to localize the key goals and targets to the understanding of the local people and a, a lot of stakeholders. And that is why in our drive to drum home the SDG framework, um, everything that we are doing now is aligned to the SDGs. And we hope that um, um, as we move on, there'll be a lot more organizations and companies and even individuals that will also appreciate that the SDGs as well. So in, in brief, um, our pursuit of our development agenda in Accra, it's within the framework of SDGs. And we are able to track our development based on the SDG goals and then the targets. What we are seeking to do is to leverage um, um, on um, what we have done with all that key stakeholders so that we can align the private sector interventions as well also within the SDGs. And then finally is to um, explain the SDG concept more to the understanding of a lot more local people that will appreciate that the school infrastructure there it is not just uh, a building, but it's linked to a global goal that all of us have committed ourselves to. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, wondering, Mayor uh, Aki Sawyer, Mayor Yvonne, uh, in Freetown, you have launched this uh, three-year transform Freetown plan uh, with its own, uh, I believe, uh, 19 targets. Um, how do you see the role of local leaders uh, in your context in, in tackling these bigger picture sustainable development challenges? Thanks, John, um, and good evening, everyone. Um, so the role of the lot of local leadership, I believe, is bringing these challenges um, to the local level. Um, and in doing so, providing the political direction and will providing an enabling environment, um, ensuring that we bring inclusivity, um, which means community mobilization is joining the dots, but very, very importantly, so that we don't end up with just a talking shop, it's ensuring that it's data-driven and that we're performance managing. And you mentioned Transform Freetown, which um, the mayor of Accra talked about the four-year development plan. So we condensed our four-year development plan into a three-year plan because it took us a year to plan it. Um, it's a four-year term, but we spent a year. And I've been mayor since 2018, not 2020. So I didn't start last, just, just um, a few months ago. We've had a little bit of time on this. Oh, sorry, I must have misspoken. Excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> no problem, no problem. I just wanted people to realize that we didn't, we didn't do this in six months. Um, but maybe I can just share my screen for a moment um, so that people can see how Transform Freetown visually aligns with the Sustainable Development Goals. So let me see if I can get this to work. Um, I did it before and it works. So let's see, here we go. Okay, so what you're seeing here on the left-hand side is Transform Freetown. It's four clusters, 11 priority sectors, and as you mentioned, and as it says at the top of the screen, 19 specific targets to be delivered across each of these sectors. So 19 in total, some have two, some have one of these 11. But in, in, in articulating, and I think what's really important when you talk about local government's approach in the development, in the validation, and now in the implementation, of the targets across these 11 sectors, there has been significant community involvement. And I use the word community very loosely. So that means, um, for example, at the start of the process, 
we engaged 15,000 of our residents to look at the level of service delivery across each of these targets um, and across each of these sectors. It means as well that we brought together stakeholders from the ministries, departments and agencies at central government level. We brought private sector, we brought development partners, we brought NGOs together to look at the technical barriers, the biggest challenges we face as a city across these sectors. And then we articulated together a theory of change and determined what those, what those targets would be. So for example, under envir environmental management, and you can see where it hits the sustainable development goals, um, we've got targets which include increasing vegetation cover by 50%. Within sanitation, again, hitting a number of the sustainable development goals, very practical targets of increasing waste collection, liquid and solid from 6% and 21% respectively to at least 60%. So what does local government bring and how does it tie into the SDGs? What we have is a framework which is aligned to ensuring that as we drive through an integrated approach to urban development, including, for example, under urban planning and housing, the construction of at least 5,000 affordable homes, that we're doing so in a manner which brings community on board, which ensures that we've got data at the heart of this and is aligned to the SDGs. So it's really making the SDGs practical at the level of the city um, and implementation. Thanks. Amazing. I, I'd love to dive into that a little more in the next round and kind of how you thought that through and, and what you think the lessons are perhaps for others. Uh, but before that, Mauricio, uh, love to hear your answer to this, really this first principal question, now that maybe you've had some time to reflect <laughs> having left office, you know, what, and even watch the crisis that's going on right now, how do you see the, what's the thing you'd really want other people to understand about the, the uniqueness of the role of local leaders? Thank you so much, uh, John. Uh, thanks to Sid Washington for this kind invitation. It's, Great to uh, be sharing this panel with you and, of course, my good friends, the mayors of uh, Freetown and Accra. Uh, so the, the first thing I think we, we need to have very clear is the importance of cities to meet the SDGs, right? Without cities, without an effective role from cities, it will be impossible for countries to meet the sustainable development goals. Why? Because See, more than half of the world's population live in cities right now. Um, it is in cities where, you know, the most global pressing issues will be defined. Climate change, you know, cities are the places where more than 70% of CO2 emissions are being generated. Cities uh, are where, uh, you know, more nearly 80% of global GDP is generated. So, you know, without cities playing a major role on this agenda, it will be impossible to meet the goals that um, were established in the Agenda 2030. So, so that's the fundamental role that cities and local governments play in this regard. Now, the other very interesting thing about this is that the SDGs are a great, great and very comprehensive set of policy goals, right? That can play a lot of different roles for cities. One very first, uh, one very important one is uh, the SDGs are actually an extraordinary urban planning tool, right? So if you look at this comprehensive set of policy goals and you implement them, uh, implement them in the mid and long term planning exercises from a city, I mean that's great because you have a set framework, right? very well designed, again, very comprehensive because it touches on nearly most, the most important aspects for, for human well-being, right? And as a consequence of being an important and very helpful planning tool for cities, it is also a great measurement tool, right? And, and, and both the mayors from Freetown and Accra have, uh, you know, touched upon this, this, this issue. Um, you have now a comprehensive set of policy goals that you can measure over time. And I think that's extremely helpful for cities, right? 
And I think that um, the goal of a mayor or a local government should be to implement policy actions that at the same time can address several SDGs, right? That was something that, for example, we tried to do. Um, for ex we we uh, worked a lot on our, and I will give you a practical example of this. Uh, we worked a lot on our urban garden program, right? Uh, the urban garden program addressed several SDGs at the same time. It addressed the issue of climate change, right? As, a, as an adaptation uh, action. It addressed the issue of poverty reduction because this urban garden program became a, an income tool for low income families. It addressed the issue of gender equality because more than 80% of people working on these gardens uh, were women, right? Uh, it addressed the issue of uh, food security at the same time. And it is also a resilience capability building mechanism, which is now more important than ever after COVID-19. So I think that this is the kind of policy goals a city should be looking for, right? To implement those programs that can address several SDGs at the same time. Besides, of course, having the SDGs as a medium and long-term planning tool. In Quito, we developed um, what's called Quito's Vision 2040, which basically address you know, the kind of action that the city uh, should, um, should undertake in the future towards meeting the, the SDGs uh, and, and all of their positive spillovers, right? Now, to finalize, I just want to mention very briefly what I see as a challenge for cities. And it's the, the complexity of communicating what the SDGs are and why they are so important. Uh, for some people, you know, uh, some part of the population which, uh, you know, have, a, you know, very urgent needs in terms of, you know, low income, um, having access to water, energy, housing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The sustainable development goals might sound too sophisticated. So I think that the challenge for mayors is to demonstrate that actually by having the SDGs as a policy planning and measurement tool, you are actually addressing what uh, the, 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 the most urgent needs of the population, and you are actually are talking about improving people's lives. I think that's that's a communication challenge for for mayors and cities, and I think there's still a lot to be done in that regard. Well, I'd love to pick up on that because you, the three of you, are clearly uh, very pro SDG. <laughs> You're, by by the definition, you're showing that it it's helpful for you, or it, as you think about the challenges, which is the point <laughs> to be helpful. And and you are, I think, nice articulated there, uh, Mayor Rodas, why it's important to have both the planning and the budgeting and the performance measurement sides. But several mayors I talk to say, well, you know, I I care about these issues anyhow. <laughs> the SDG language makes it too hard or it makes it sound like a UN thing. Whereas I want to, I'm talking about local things and local politics. We don't want to import someone else's politics, things like that. And maybe there's different words that work better for local people who might care about these things anyhow. I'm curious, how would each of you answer that concern for uh, a mayor that says, you know, I'm already doing this, these, this doesn't help me, uh, or it's just too much, or I don't have 17 departments in my city, so don't give me like what feels like more work. You know, how do you think about that? Uh, maybe uh, from the Sierra Leonean perspective to start. Thanks, John. So um, the thing about Transform Freetown is that we had developed it before I ever heard about an SDG. <laughs> So um, we came at this from the perspective, I mean, I, like others on the call, um, my background is not in the public sector. Um, I'm from the private sector. I, I ran for mayor because I was particularly concerned about the environment and sanitation in my city. And that's what made me make the decision. And in running, I mean, going through the campaign and in looking at the Local Government Act and understanding what the power of a mayor was, I took an approach because of my project management background 
um, that if I was doing this, that we needed to make sure we're touching on all the different pieces within what we could do. So we developed, the, my campaign was for a community for the progress of Freetown, which then in development speak, we translated into this framework of transform Freetown. We had done what you see on the left before I was exposed to the SDGs. But then we saw the, the importance given that we were, and this is the, the interesting bit about partnerships, collaborations and finance, which I know will come on to, we were conscious, we became conscious of the importance of speaking a language which was universal, particularly in the access of funding. So we, we actually superimposed the SDGs and created this matrix after we had developed Transform Freetown. So I guess the answer is the SDGs work because they touch on all aspects. They don't need to lead you. You're not doing this because there's a UN organization that says do SDGs. You're doing this because the stuff that needs to be done. And it's helpful um, to be able to, to speak in this language because if we do it collectively, I often think about, uh, someone was saying I was on a call with ICLE this morning, which is another of our networks, um, um, local government networks, where the, 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 the way they place it is the way that I think about it. All, every piece of ground on the globe is the subject of a local authority. Is It's run by a local authority at some level, regional, village. You know, there's some level at which there is development meant to be happening. And if in every single place we were able to have this framework, which means you just, it's just helping you think in an integrated way if you haven't done that before. Um, and if you already have done it, then it helps you to report in a way that helps us globally because we're a global village. And we know that realistically, no town, no city, no mayor is an island. What is happening in other places is impacting your economy. It's impacting migration. It's impacting climate. It's impacting your water. If you share a river with other cities. So it's impacting you. So why don't we embrace, not because, I mean, I don't want to burden my, my residents, and I very rarely speak to residents in the language of SDGs. We talk about our issues, water, health, sanitation. The SDG language is a language which is helpful for reporting on a, a more sort of a policy level, reporting up, reporting to, accessing resource, accessing finance. But when it comes to talking to, you know, my residents in Susan's Bay informal settlement, I don't start talking to them in SDG 1 and 11 and 10. No, we talk about more housing. We talk about more water. We talk about education. So I don't think the two are, are at odds. I don't think they're incompatible. I think the, the way in which you describe something needs to be tailored to your audience. Um, and, and so I don't see a conflict there. And I don't think that, I don't think that it's, it's, it needs to be a burden, but I think it helps us um, to approach this in a way which ensures that we recognize we're not alone. Because if we think we're alone and we're dealing with our problems by ourselves, we're looking for more problems. That's a very powerful. And this point on common language and neutrality, I think is a big one. And, uh, you know, I, I often say the, the goals, the SDGs are often misinterpreted as these things that the UN told the world to care about, when in reality, it's the opposite. It's things that the world told the UN not to forget about. And so what it really is, is putting everything on the same page to, to get everyone on the same page on all the things that people have said don't forget about. Uh, so it, it's interesting to hear you describe the, the, the journey that you and, and your local community have gone through. Maybe just shifting back to Accra, you know, and the, the process you've gone through on these goals, and you speak so eloquently uh, about, you know, Mr. Mayor, about the, the SDGs as central. Uh, what's your response to this question uh, on those who think that it's maybe not a helpful language or too much or too burdensome? Like, how do you make the case for why the SDGs are actually uh, a useful for what you're trying to do? As far as I'm concerned, 
I mean, there's an SDG goal which is relevant to all development challenges we face as a city. I mean, many cities proactively implement SDG goals without communicating it as such. And I alluded to it in my uh, first submission, uh, which uh, my colleagues have also reiterated the point that um, uh, we take conscious effort to address developmental programs within our cities. So uh, SDG is not an entirely new thing, but it provides us with a comprehensive development framework. And any leader who works with this framework is guaranteed to transform lives so that you don't embark on haphazard or ad hoc development. That is the accents of adopting and promoting the SDGs. And if we are able to localize the terminologies, uh, for me, at the moment, we are talking more of um, forms and not substance. So if the if the phrase or the word SDG, it's becoming a challenge for us to appreciate and work with it, that it is more foreign, it is a UN goal, but that's exactly what we are also doing. How do we localize the SDG and communicate the language? Because we are not living in an island, as said by uh, my good sister, Yvonne. We're living in a world we are part of the world, and as much as the pocket of things that we are doing all over, we must be able to connect the dots and be able to connect to the world. So this is a global framework which has been adopted. All of us believes that the, the goals set out by, by the UN and the targets are very relevant, and that's what, and that's why in Ghana, as I said, we have changed our development framework to, with, to suit the SDGs. Because whatever that we are doing, it's within the framework of the. I don't see anything really outside the exit, even in partnerships. My good sister spoke about ECLE program. This is like, I'm sure he's talking about Ring to Reference SDG 17, where you're talking about partnerships, you know, and that's what we're doing. When you also spoke a little bit about my profile, you mentioned C40 cities and global covenant of mayors, all these are partnership because we appreciate the fact that we cannot do it without even partnerships with a couple of people. And that is why in Ghana, in Accra to be specific, you know, we've submit, subjected ourselves to the voluntary local review. That has become a useful tool for communicating with our constituents because we have not been able to be communicating the issues clearly with our constituents because as leaders and your staff that you are working with have not been properly oriented to accept and adopt the SDG language. So we are still stuck in the old ways of communicating with our informal settlements, the informal communities. And in our part of the world, you know, Africa, where the informal community is so huge, 74% of the labor force in Accra are employed in the informal sector. So the language must be modified to suit it, but you can't run away from the SDG framework, which we have all admitted to it. And as much as the UN is championing the SDGs, we are also making it local relevant. It will take a bit of time for all of us to appreciate it. And as local leaders, how do we communicate the SDGs to our stakeholders and the local people without necessarily letting it sound like a UN thing, but it's our thing. And that's what we have decided to do, that the language of SDG has become part of our legal framework, our development program that we are pushing and everything that we are, we are going about it. Thank you. 
Well, it's interesting even just to hear about, you know, the voluntary local reviews uh, for the SDGs, which have taken this whole national conversation from the original SDG process or agreements to really take it to the ground level. And I have to say, it's been quite inspiring to watch so many cities like yours. Uh, you know, I think New York, it's only three years uh, since they first announced an interest in doing this, if not less. And uh, I think there are now hundreds of cities around the world that have taken this up to initiate a new type of conversation uh, exactly along the lines of what you're both discussing to really say, you know, we're doing this anyways, but how do we use it I mean, to get a quick, people? A quick, a quick intervention here. You know? Yeah. Um, as much as we are using the SDGs for our development framework, yeah. I must admit that we had not we have not embedded it in our language until yeah. until we submitted ourselves to the ECA, the voluntary review framework. Yeah. That enabled us to connect the dots properly, you know, and we're able to link the issues properly. Our bureaucratic setup is it's slow to adopt and it takes a long time for them to change the way they do their things. So the partnership arrangement and the available tools that we have, and I'm sure working with you and many other organizations, will help to reorient our city, especially the human resource, the leadership that we are providing, so that it does not become just a political tool right. and a political language, but becomes part of the city language that all of us are supposed to use. Well, it's very powerful. And maybe then, uh, Mayor Rota, uh, different region, different politics, different language. <laughs> uh, you know, curious, uh, different conversation. Uh, how do you answer this this question when it comes up? Well, I, I think again, uh, for me, the, the beauty of the SDGs is that it's a very comprehensive policy framework, right? That helps you to to do things orderly, right? And 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 you know. Uh, implementing policies, taking into account different aspects and desired effects, like the ones that I mentioned when I described the, the urban garden program here in Quito. So I think that in and on itself is positive, is helpful for cities as, a, as an internal measure, right? A planning one and a measurement one. Now, I think that very interestingly, the SDGs and the awareness of the importance of cities to meet them right, has also um, raised the importance of cities at the international arena, right? So having come up with this great framework of policies, right, and understanding that, you know, cities must play a vital role to fulfill them, right, uh, has given cities a very interesting and, and increasingly growing platform to speak up at the international stage, right? Because now we have something standardized to discuss about, right? Which is how are we, are we making progress towards the SDGs? How are we measuring the SDGs? How are cities, you know, committing very rapidly to deliver voluntarily, voluntarily local reviews, right? How is that given to the UN system? So it has become another space for cities to raise their uh, influence at the international level, which I think is very interesting. Now, we all know that the main challenge cities face when it comes to localizing the SDGs is financing, right? And, and this is something that I keep on mentioning because, and I'm sure that uh, my, my dear colleagues will agree with me about this, is, you know, if cities want to really implement this seriously, right, they need much better access to finance, which they don't have as of now. Why? Because we have an international financial architecture that was not designed for cities. It was designed for countries. And that has not changed, or at least in the pace we need, right? So if we all are aware of the importance of cities to meet, to meet the SDGs, if we understand the vital role they are playing for doing this, we also need to come up with ways for cities to have better access to financing. And that's a big, big challenge that even though has been addressed slowly, much, much more needs to be done, even more so, again, in the light of COVID-19, because cities have demonstrated to be 
at the forefront of dealing with COVID-19. And many of the SDGs are related to, to the effects of COVID-19 and the need for recovery, uh, I mean, the need for cities to recover from that. So again, the issue of financing is something that should be uh, addressed much more seriously uh, for cities to do the, what they need and they can do to meet the SDGs. I'm so glad you raised that, Mauricio. And just as a quick time check, we only have about 15 minutes left and we want to turn to questions from the audience. Uh, I've got one that's been shared, but just want to invite the audience to uh, submit them through the platform and they'll be relayed to us. We'll try to, uh, or even less than 15 minutes, I'm told it's closer to 10. So we're going to go to a lightning round of sorts. We've covered so much. But I'm curious, we have, we have a question that's been uh, submitted uh, from Lisa McGregor, and I'm just going to, uh, you know, tweak it a little bit. I'm curious if each of you can describe something uh, just in a, a minute that's happened this year in 2020 that you think illustrates the challenge that you're facing somewhat uniquely, perhaps, as a mayor uh, in tackling the challenge of sustainable development. So I think that this question of the crisis and which many cities are facing and sustainable development. Is there something that you kind of want everyone to know is the type of challenge you're facing this year that embodies the challenge of sustainable development? Anyone in Accra? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Well, uh, well uh, um, first of all, uh, I mean, the biggest thing this year is COVID-19. So I mean, you can't run away, but I'm looking at COVID-19 and its impact on the main constituency, which is the informal sector and how it's been addressed. So um, the main pillar that is entrenched in our development philosophy is inclusivity because if we go on the development paradigm that is heavily westernized, we are likely to, to, to lose out 74% of our, uh, of our populace. So inclusivity is very key. And let me give you another example. In Accra, the informal market is so huge. So you may have mobs, but people still come to the informal market to buy things. And that's where the trading and all the activities goes on. Somebody have a small table that is selling, but that table has been able to give him money to take care of his kids and give him build a house and is still selling some food on that small table. You need to appreciate that. Then because you don't have bigger markets and a lot of people are also coming in to trade, so they are taking a lot more space. How do you I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to have to ask you to be quick just so we can go through this. Sorry. No, I don't want to interrupt just to ask you to keep it short uh, so that we can hear from right, the other people. Right, questions. right. So my point here is that, yet COVID-19 is the biggest thing, but it is in part on the informal sector and how we have responded to it through our development philosophy of inclusivity has still kept us safe, kept our economy to be more resilient and to continue to thrive in the face of COVID-19. Thank you. That's great. And maybe just back to you, Mauricio, uh, you know, you mentioned the funding and then go, go back to uh, Mary Vaughn. Uh, you mentioned the funding. I think you just had a major uh, breakthrough last week, if I understand. Maybe you can just share a little bit about that because it's somewhat big news, perhaps, on the issue you're just raising. Yes. Well, we were talking about the importance of, you know, uh, promote reforms to the international financial system to make it more cities friendly and to create new facilities for cities to have direct access to financing. So, uh, yeah, last Friday uh, during the Urban 20 Summit, you know, the Urban 20 is uh, uh, the engagement group of cities with the G20, the top 20 economies in the world. And since the G20 is mostly about financing, the U20 is in a unique position uh, to discuss these issues and to promote new things. So last Friday, <clears throat> the Urban 20 launched what's called the Global Urban Resilience Fund, uh, which will become the first ever cities-led fund 
a fund that is set up and that will be managed by a cities platform, in this case, the U20, with the perspectives of cities for cities. And I think this is a great milestone, right? Because the problem that many cities face is that they, for example, what they want, when they want to access to international financing, uh, they need a national guarantee, a national guarantee that might not be granted by the national government because of political rivalries with local governments. And that's preventing cities from accessing to the necessary finance, financing uh, you know, resources to, to implement the SDGs or to advance with the climate change agenda, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, they, I think that's why this is so important, the fact of having this new fund that will be managed under a city's perspective, understanding cities to tackle with COVID-19 and future external shocks, right? In general, resilience, infrastructure, and capability building. So I think that's very good news for the city's space worldwide. Congratulations, Global Global Urban Resilience Fund, I think you said. So watch this space. Hopefully it provides a boon uh, to many cities around the world and, and a new way of thinking uh, about the opportunities. Uh, Mary Vaughn, now, any any practical examples that you think really hit home on uh, you know the challenge that you've been feel, facing this year? Uh, I, I can't talk about this year without talking about what's gone on with our property rate. And it really touches on two of the things that Mauricio just mentioned, um, and Mercy made mention of political space um, and fiscal space. And in this year with COVID and all the challenges and increased uh, risk um, that, that's created vulnerabilities, increased vulnerabilities, as with the mayor of Accra, we have a very high percentage of our population working in informal setup, in informal economy. Um, we, we've found ourselves in, in a position where we introduced a new property rate system, digital. Um, it was actually, you know, sort of featured quite extensively on in, in many international platforms as being um, progressive, innovative, and and um, and really, you know, sort of giving us the. It, it met one of our targets, right? So we were supposed to increase uh, tax by fivefold in order for us to invest much needed resource into uh, the infrastructure of the city and into service delivery. Unfortunately, we found ourselves in a position where government stopped it um, initially for COVID and then for, due, for a process technical point. Um, and, and so the challenge that cities face, which can be about political space to deliver on our mandates um, and of course fiscal space, because if you don't have easy access to external funding, you find yourself very quickly constrained. Um, it happened to be the year of COVID. Uh, we have a lot of interventions which were donor funded with COVID, which have kind of enabled us to effectively keep the city going. But I think this is a demonstration of how at the local level where SDGs need to be delivered, how that can be constrained by political and fiscal um, sort of constraints. So constraints in delivery because of constraints in political and fiscal space. Uh, well, it's incredible. I could spend hours talking with you, but I think we're approaching the end of time already. Uh, and so uh, probably best to uh, adjourn now rather than uh, cut someone off in the final 60 seconds. So let me please just thank well, uh, our distinguished mayors uh, for your leadership. Uh, for your commitment and, and your inspiration. You're not just serving your own communities with uh, extraordinary distinction, but you're also providing, uh, I think, a lot of hope to the world, each of you. So we're very grateful uh, for what you're teaching us and how you're showing the way. And uh, let me also thank the Society for International Development, uh, Washington Group, for bringing this group together. I think we've seen, uh, you know, this is a journey. It's not a flip of a switch. Uh, each of us is uh, kind of picking up the pieces as we move forward in these new frontiers. Uh, and we're seeing the local leaders doing it in such a compelling way. Uh, everyone is operating amidst the constraints, even amidst the, especially and even amidst the crisis, which opens up some opportunities, but also, you know, brings some new, uh, new burdens. And uh, we're just so grateful to each of you for your, your thoughtfulness and dedication again. So, uh, Please join me, everyone, in thanking the panel and uh, really an honor to be spending a bit of time with you all today. Thank you so much.